Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, now I feel the anxiety. <laughs> so if I forgot anyone, <laughs> I apologize. I do want to thank very much uh, to my beloved wife uh, that without her, I don't think that um, I could have succeeded as much as I do. Um, so, this is called Impossible Groups that Flourish in Leaking Containers, Challenging Group Analytic Theory. Actually, it should be a question mark. Are we challenging group analytic theory? And we start with a quote from uh, Through the Looking Glass. Alice laughed. There is no use trying, she said. One can't believe impossible things. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the queen. When I was your age, I always did it half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast. <laughs> In 2004, as part of my co-chair responsibilities for the IAGB conference of 2006, my wife and I went all over Brazil to promote the conference. In a straw hut in a favela, a poor neighborhood in Fort Alese in Brazil, we were invited to witness Adalberto Barreto doing what he titled community therapy, a new kind of group therapy. About 30 people, most favela inhabitants, attended. Issues of boundaries and confidentiality were very different from what I do in my practice. People went in and out, Children were included, sometimes trying to sell us postcards. The whole event was recorded, and hostesses entered with refreshments during the session. Still, it seemed that the participants were not troubled by the boundary violations. I was surprised at the depth of personal problems presented. I expected that people would talk about problems of the community, community therapy but they presented the same problems that I see in my therapy groups. A woman told of her daughter's relationship with a married man who became violent when the daughter decided to leave him. One day, he drugged the mother and she found himself, herself naked in bed with him. Another speaker had learning difficulties and said that only half of his brain functioned. He brought his friend to help in case he forgot to say something important. How is such a group session possible? This group setting negated everything I teach about the need for boundaries and safety in groups. And still, a high level of self-disclosure developed. In my group analytic practice and my professional activities as a group therapist, supervisor, and educator, I have encountered many group situations that do not follow the rules described in the textbook. In sum, the setting is quite different from what is recommended in theory, as seen above in the uh, favela, while others do not follow the developmental stages that the books detail. Under these conditions, we would not expect members of the group to feel safe enough to open up nor that the group will be able to work through deep issues. Nevertheless, surprisingly, under the right conductorship, these groups seem to progress into advanced stages. It is as if they flourish in leaking containers. I borrowed, by the way, the term from Durban Lazar and Gila Offer's article about the cracked container. I changed it into the uh, leaking container. How does this happen? Should we change or adjust our theories? Please note that I'm not advocating that people design impossible groups. I'm interested in exploring how impossible groups that already exist function and what makes them, in fact, possible. So what are the basic conditions for group progress? In preparation for this lecture, I reviewed many textbooks on group psychotherapy to see what they write about the minimal necessary conditions for conducting a group. I was surprised not to find such explicit written conditions. For years, I have taught group therapy, supervised and consulted for, uh, junior therapists. 
I've always insisted that first and foremost, we need to establish safety in our groups, usually through managing the group boundaries. I was sure that such conditions would be written clearly in the introductory chapter of every book. However, I did not find these conditions easily at first. Here's what I did find in the textbooks. Fuchs described the main tools with which we achieve therapeutic goals in groups, encouraging the relaxation of censorship, frank disclosure of personal feelings and experience and of feelings towards other members of the group, and active membership. Yalom and Lesh also emphasize the importance of self-disclosure as a prerequisite for the formation of meaningful, inter meaningful interpersonal relationships in a group. They bring research evidence that supports the importance of self-disclosure for the success of the group since high self-disclosure increases group cohesiveness, which is one of the main factors contributing to therapeutic positive results. It goes without saying that self-disclosure develops in a safe environment. Exposing deep issues or secrets about oneself when the situation is high, unsafe is highly risky and actually reveals poor reality testing. However, as we saw in the example above, and as we will see later, in many groups, people are ready to self-disclose under what looks like very unsafe conditions. How is this possible? After digging deeper, I found that Yalom clearly states that forces that the forces, sorry, states the forces that threaten group cohesiveness, continued tardiness, absences, subgrouping, disruptive extra-group socialization, and scapegoating all threaten the integrity of the group. Fuchs also writes that arriving punctually and attending regularly are important therapeutic pointers. Later, I will describe groups with tardiness, absences, subgrouping, and extra group socialization that thrive in these leaking containers. How come? In another textbook of Rutan Stone and Shea, Psychodynamic Group Psychotherapy, we find a major role task is management of boundaries. The challenge for the therapist is to create flexible boundaries that can ensure the integrity of the group but are not so loose the structure and safety are sacrificed. And here is the fundamental task of the therapist. Perhaps this is the ideal task of the group analyst, but what happens when the group members persistently come late or are absent because of the requir requirement of their job and not due to inner struggles? Can safety still be established? Can the group still function well under those 40 circumstances? Should we conduct groups at all under such problematic conditions? I want to emphasize that the idea of safety is sometimes overrated or even misused by group members. Um, Avi Berman uh, calls the group a half-safe half environment. I don't feel safe here, said a participant in my group. And when I asked her what made her feel unsafe, she mentioned a conflict that two group members recently had. Exploring it further, she associated it with a, the combative atmosphere in her family of origin, where conflicts were never resolved and it usually felt unsafe. Now, does it mean that we should create a perfect, safe environment for this woman to correct her faulty childhood atmosphere, or should we establish a bad enough playground to allow her to explore these early experiences in a relatively safe place? What is this bad enough that, and, and still relatively safe space? This question has both practical and theoretical implications. We can easily say that any disruption of the optimal conditions in the group function is just grist for the mill. But from a practical point of view, when do we decide that the diversion from those conditions does not allow the group to develop and prosper? Since good practice should always be based on good theory, 
we should also explain how group members can still benefit from impossible groups and what allows for their development and success. But first, let me introduce several kinds of groups that do not follow the rules. There are many examples of impossible groups. Demonstration groups in conferences or training programs. Institute groups at the AGPA, the American Group Psychotherapy Association. Resident group where members do not attend meetings regularly. Non-Western groups where the culture does not allow a stormy stage. Groups that function well in times of war and terror. Inpatient groups in a psychiatric ward in which the membership changes from one session to another. <clears throat> and indeed, Yalom developed a specific model based on a one session intervention for these groups. And internet groups where the boundaries are incredibly loose. However, due to space limitation, I address only some of these examples. Let's start with training groups with frequent absences and tardiness. As I mentioned above, both Fuchs and Yalom agree that arriving punctually and attending regularly is crucial for healthy functioning of the group. Absences and tardiness disrupt the group's stability and threaten its safe boundaries. One of the main tasks of the group conductor is to manage the group boundaries, whether by interpreting the lateness or frequent absences or by reminding the group of its agreement and contract. However, what do you do when the group is unable to follow such an agreement due to the organization in which it exists? Training groups, T group, for psychiatric residents can be a good example for such impossible groups. These T groups are offered to psychiatric residents in some psychiatric programs in the US, maybe also here in the UK. Their purpose ranges from providing therapy to helping the residents deal with the enormous stresses associated with psychiatric studies to learning from experience about leading therapy groups. From the beginning, these groups suffer from problematic boundary issues both between therapy and training and between personal and professional relationships. The residents have pre-existing professional and personal relationship, continue to meet between the sessions as part of their training and studies and are part of a larger system, the psychiatric training program of the medical school. In some programs, participation in these groups is mandatory. Dale Godby and his friends from uh, Dallas that came here uh, conduct such groups. While in others, it is not. In a training program, members of the faculty invariably contend for training's time, for trainees' time. Encroachment on the time of the training group can easily become a problem. Here I will introduce the case of a resident process group that I co-led where participation was vol voluntary and focus on the issue of unstable attendance. So this is the example. The members of this process group I co-led in a psychiatry program came from all over all the years of studies. In the first year, they rotate between hospital departments in order to accumulate experience in various medical areas. In some of these wards, for example, when they work in the internal medicine department for two months out of the first year, they have almost no control over their time and are not allowed to leave their post. Even in later years, when they treat psychiatric patients, they are not always masters of their time. And they have to deal with patients in crisis, supervisors who do not understand or agree that the process group time boundaries should take priority and etc. This meant that frequently, many of them could not come on time. And we usually started the group with three to six of the 10 members, and with the rest arriving five to 10 minutes later, or not at all. These conditions created situations where participation in the group was unstable. I felt more and more frustrated by the situation. Although I knew <clears throat> that they were not solely to blame and they did not have a lot of control over their time, I felt de-skilled 
and that my ability to interpret this attack on the group time boundaries was taken away. I felt helpless. At one point, where I couldn't tolerate my frustration anymore, I blasted the group with one of my worst, best interventions. This is so frustrating. It is one of the worst group settings I've ever had. I don't remember leading a group with so many absences and latecomers. How can you connect deeply um, when you do not know who will be here next week? Don't you feel that it limits your ability to use this group? It limits mine. Silence fell upon the group after this harsh intervention. Strange. The group seemed paralyzed for a while, so I asked, Perhaps you want to share your feelings around what I said. <laughs> a discussion developed around how I intervened, and I acknowledged, took responsibility for my impulsivity. After processing their reactions, one of the members said, I actually agree with you. Sometimes I wonder whether we are making enough effort to be on time. When some of the members come late, I feel irritated, as if they do not take the group seriously enough. A discussion followed about how much responsibility and control they did have. A woman said with tears, I'm trying hard to be a good student, a good resident, but I feel as if nothing I do will be enough. Don't you see that I'm doing my best? Later, she associated those feelings to a family of origin where she never felt that she fulfilled her father's expectations. The group conductors reflected the dilemma of the residents being in a demanding system that swallows their time and energy, making them feel helpless, powerless, and under, uh, and under relentless uh, scrutiny. scrutiny. And I pointed out how I was caught in a parallel process. I also felt helpless and powerless. This example shows that even under conditions that hinder the group progress, group members can touch deep issues and do meaningful work. I have many more examples from this specific group. Actually, this group originated my idea of uh, impossible groups. Uh, the idea started when I said, this is impossible, but how is it possible? And I asked the permission of the residents, by the way, to use them, and they agreed. There were powerful moments and significant events showing that, surprisingly, the participants felt safe enough to disclose and process their inner experience and their relationship with one another and with the group conductors, as happens in any other group. Second example is demonstration groups. In the only paper I know uh, written about demonstration group, Gans, Rutan, and Leip state, you can read it. I found out that if I let you read it, it saved me time. <laughs> demonstration group, are quite common at the AGPA conferences in the USA and in group therapy training uh, institutes as a way to learn about groups by observing a live group. There are many conditions that seem to hinder such groups' progress. <clears throat> the physical boundaries consist of a circle of chairs with no walls defining the group space and a very permeable membrane exists between the demonstration group and the observers. The audience is observing and listening to everything that the members of the group say or do, so confidentiality is threatened. The audience is composed of colleagues who have professional relationship with the volunteers, so the group member's ability to be authentic is restricted. There are pre-existing relationship between members of the demo group and between them and the observing group, so many dual relationships are present. The time allocated for the demonstration group is very short, Sometimes a session can be as short as 45 minutes, so there is no time for deep group dynamics to develop. Even Gans, Rutan, and Leib concluded, boundary issues in a demonstration group can be so complex and confusing that some wonder if effective teaching is even possible, but it is. 
From my experience leading demo group, I have been surprised how frequently self-disclosure occurs in them. We might explain these cases as a kind of role responsiveness, responsiveness or even role suction, or maybe exhibitionism. But it means that group dynamics created in demo groups are so powerful that they suck mature people very quickly into behaviors they cannot control. Next example, <clears throat> when, the group, when the group container is attacked by reality. Sometimes a group container is attacked from the outside by harsh reality. This is especially true nowadays in times of ubiquitous, um, ubiquitous terror and in countries affected by war. When terror events threaten group members from the outside, it is hard to expect that they will be able to playfully reflect on the events of the group. I conducted a one-day process group for therapists the day after the horrible terror attack in Paris in November 2015, not long ago. The group took place in a nearby European country, and I started it after not sleeping all night long, listening to the news and trying to deal with my own anxiety. At the beginning of the group, I suggested that, the, that we all agree to confidentiality, as I usually do. One person objected. I've never had that happen, and other group members reacted with irritation and puzzlement. When asked for his reasons, he explained that agreeing to confidentiality is just a ritual, and nobody knows what will really happen. True, but strange. As the group went on, it was stuck in the schizoparanoid position, full of distrust and suspicion. Even when they had moments of more closeness and warmth, they immediately withdrew again to distance and isolation. For me, it was clear that the group, including the person who disagreed with the confidentiality agreement, whom we can easily label the defiant leader, was reacting to the dangerous outside world and I interpreted the group atmosphere accordingly. However, the collapse of the potential space could not be stopped, and group members could not reflect and see the event in the group as symbolic. They really perceived the defiant leader as a potential terrorist threatening their well-being and even existence. This example of a failure of the group analyst to compensate for the leaking container can help us understand how the presence of the conductor might be a crucial factor in, we in whether these kind of group flourish or not. On the surface, I made the right intervention and said the appropriate sentences. I interpreted the outside stress, threat, and I shift the, the focus away from the defiant leader. However, my interventions were more technical and inside, I felt tired and anxious, overwhelmed by unprocessed annihilation anxieties. In a chapter that Raufman and I wrote for the upcoming book, Group Analysis in the Land of uh, Milk and Honey, Honey uh, edited by Robbie Friedman and Yael Doron, we discussed a similar situation but with better results. In a group composed of Israeli, Jewish, and Palestinian students in Israel, using literature text as a way to explore inner reality, someone chose to bring to the group one of Tagore's, Rabindranath Tagore's poems as a stimulus. The poem includes one line that describes traditional space. On the seashore of endless worlds, children play. Indeed, this line was chosen by Winnicott as a motto for his article about transitional space. Unfortunately, the group took place in the summer of 2014, at the time of the disputed Israeli operation in Gaza. On the day the poem was introduced to the group, Palestinian children playing on the seashore of Gaza were killed inadvertently by Israeli bombing. The intrusion of this reality became an attack on the metaphoric aspect of the poem. The playful quality was dismissed, and the poem became a cynical and ironic 
description of the cruel reality and an enactment of anxieties related to situations of war and conflict in which survivors need, need, do not follow for, do not allow for playful experiences. The reaction to Tagore's poem strongly posed the basic dilemma as to whether the group could survive or not. Fortunately, this situation was managed well by the group conductor. And the result was that in spite of the difficult situation and problematic time, the participants were determined not to miss the sessions and showed up to every meeting. They also kept bringing literary text a fact that was both ironic and essential. How could this group survive under these attacks from both outside and inside? My last example is about internet groups. <clears throat> Some people thought that I will talk only about internet groups today because I'm well known as an internet person. But no, not only. Although I have written one of the first published articles about online group dynamics in 2001 and continued with a book called Alone in the Presence of Virtual Others in 2014, um, um, although I discuss internet forums and not therapy groups, some of my conclusions are valid for online therapy groups as well. Internet forums, you know probably the GASI, um, I have a similar uh, discussion list uh, the group psychotherapy, the GP forum. Um, some participants of the GP forum are here too. So internet forums have no solid space or time boundaries. According to any theory of group therapy and group processes, the lack of clear boundaries on the internet should restrict the possibility of group cohesion, reduce the sense of safety, and limit intimate talk. However, research show that people tend to reveal more in virtual communication than in face-to-face -face meeting. Self-disclosure is surprisingly high despite loose boundaries and a flexible setting in the internet forum and online discussion list. As an example, let me bring an exchange of emails with permission from my group psychotherapy GP forum when one of our members lost his baby shortly after birth. Please read. This is the original, and these are the responses of people to the original email. This kind of communication is not very different from any empathic resonance that happens in a cohesive, well-functioning group. One explanation can be that this is due to the anonymity, anonymity of the members in the forums, which reduces the risk and the risks of ridicule or rejection of people disclosing personal information similar to the stranger on the train phenomenon. However, the above excerpt is taken from a professional forum where colleagues are personally identified by their names and many of them know one another through meetings at group therapy conferences. My observation is that such health disclosure happens even in forums where members are not anonymous. Actually, the potential of the internet to blur the boundaries between reality and fantasy, body and mind, is perceived not only as increasing the potential for self-expression, but also, also as symbolizing the freedom of the human spirit, unbounded by space and time, just like in a virtual form. But you might insist that such a forum that is limited to communication in text, they, it is too detached and cannot actually be compared to the real experience in group therapy session. So let me present another internet example which is closer to therapy group. Online process groups using video. In the last year, I started research comparing these kind of groups to face-to-face -face ones. I direct a doctorate program focused on group therapy at the Professional School of Psychology in California, a program integrating distance learning and face-to-face -face workshops. Our students attend a two-day intensive process group, face-to-face, uh, -face, followed by monthly 
two hour online meeting. This is how an online meeting looks like when disguising the identity of the participant. <laughs> now, actually, this is a class in Purim. Purim is a Jewish holiday when you use <laughs> uh, customs and, and masks. So, but this is how it looks in the uh, process group. You see people in boxes, and they see one another, and the conductors are also there, OK? This is not an example of a process group, but of a class. But it's the same in a process group. Now that you understood how it works, here's a short transcript from a group meeting. Please read it. Now, if you saw this uh, transcript, and I wouldn't tell you, wouldn't have told you that this is taken from an uh, online group, would you know whether it's a face-to-face -face one or online one? It looks like the um, uh, interaction and feedback we expect to find in a process or a therapy group in an advanced stage, actually. In a workshop I co-conducted at the AGPA about online groups, we sent the participants to their hotel rooms, asking them to connect through their tablets for an online demonstration group co-conducted by the workshop leaders. So I connect uh, both the demonstration group and the online group. The participants expressed their wish to connect with one another when they started uh, the process group, the uh, demo group, they wanted to connect with one another despite the barriers. And they found an original way to overcome the online limitations by attaching their palms to the boundary of the picture on the screen. Yeah, imagine the box, you attach your palm as if you want to touch the other in the virtual reality. Uh, creating the illusion of touching the hand of the other member in a nearby boxed picture. Interestingly enough, just two days before, um, I had seen the play, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Middle of the Night, played in London as well, describing the inner world of an adolescent with autistic or Asperger features. As he could not tolerate people touching him, his parents learned how to connect with him in a creative way. I was fascinated to see how in both cases, whether due to physical or psychological or to group setting limitations, people find the same creative way to connect and overcome the difficulties. Let's see if the video works, Martha. Christopher, touch my hand. Okay. Are you tired? Now to the theory. Now you have to be awake. <laughs> In order to understand how this impossible group function well, we first need to understand which psychological mechanism makes them impossible. The main issue seemed to be about leaks in the group container. Bion, uh, cited by Hinshelwood, describes three kinds of relationship between the container and the contained. One, the contents are so vibrant and explosive that the whole container is exploded and disabled with uncontained results. Two, the container is so rigid that it does not allow of any ex real expression of the contents, which are then simply molded in, a contain, in the containing space. And three, both the container and the contents adapt and mold in response to one another so that both are able to develop and grow. 
I would add another possibility in which the container is not strong or solid enough to hold even non-explosive content. In the T group, demo group, and internet groups, it is not, that, it is not the content that is difficult to contain, but the leaking container itself. In the case of groups in times of war and terror, the picture is more complicated. Mechanisms of equivalence, as Earl Hopper uh, mentioned, and projective identification weaken the container when attacks from the outside are enacted and replicated inside the group. Eventually, the boundary becomes so porous and is unable to protect the group from outside pressures. Indeed, sometimes we can also identify aspects of Nitsun's anti-group contributing to these attacks on linking, on the container and on the group, as might have happened in the group after the terror attack in Paris. However, as said, in most of the above group examples, <clears throat> it is not the act of the anti-group or explosive content that makes the group impossible. It is the fact that the setting of the group is inherently problematic, whether because the boundaries are loose, the attendance is unstable, or the pressures from the outside are too severe. Perhaps now we can speculate what allowed these groups to thrive. <clears throat> Shlapoberski, in his recent book, writes, the two elements, condi elementary conditions for successful group therapy, on the one hand, membership and composition, and on the other, the capabilities of the conductor, both have determining influences on the quality of the group's work. He also states, the conductor's primary job is to equip people to play safely with human experience and do so across its wide range of emotion. Perhaps the group conductor can provide something to compensate for boundary problems and leaking containers. What we as group analysts are trying to achieve is creating a reflective space the term reflexive space indicates the aspect of the group in which members like, link emotionally and from which personalities can emerge. No matter what the conditions of the group are, we help the group use the transitional space, the group matrix that is automatically created when people come together in a way that will be beneficial for the members growth. We support me, uh, making the, this space a playground in which the participants can free associate, connect emotionally, explore their inner thoughts and feelings, and reflect on the concrete events that occur in the group and in their lives in a way that goes beyond the concrete events themselves. We help them use symbols and metaphors and see life broadly. So, how do we help a group with impossible conditions to strive? I believe that one of the most important factors contributing to the unlikely success of the impossible group is a secure presence. This is a term that I bought from one of my students, Anker Neeman Kanto. The secure presence of the group conductor. This secure presence can compensate for fuzzy conditions, loose boundaries, and leaking containers. What is this secure presence and how it is created? This is still quite an enigma for me. Fuchs, whose memory we honor through this annual lecture, was always described as having a warm, even radiating presence. But I have not found any detailed description of this presence or an explanation for the influence that he had on others, except for a hint in what James Anthony said in the second annual Fuchs lecture in 1978. Perhaps the most valuable lesson I received from Fuchs was on the value of unobtrusiveness on the part of the therapist. So this is strange, unobtrusive on the one hand, but a very radiant uh, influence, very secure presence. In my book about internet groups, I devoted an entire chapter to the question of presence and how it can be created even online. I showed that although traditionally presence involve the body, this physical presence only supports subjective presence. The presence of the therapist involves his or her immersion, passion, attention, emotional involvement, reverie, 
and readiness to be drawn into enactment, as Grossmark said. However, there is something beyond these features, and I believe it is how the group analyst holds the group in his or her mind. Our ability to hold the group as a whole in our mind as a reflective space and to remain hopeful can compensate for unsafe conditions. In the example of the group I conducted immediately after the terror attacks in Paris, I was too tired and anxious to keep the hope for the frightened participants and was too preoccupied with the real events to hold in mind the option of reflection and symbolization. At other times, the presence of the core leader, as in the resident group example, have proved essential in supporting the secure presence of leadership. However, the group therapist cannot act in a void and does not act in a void. And it is no less important to look at the contribution of the group members for the success of those groups. As we mentioned, the container and the contained, we need to remember that the contained is not a passive actor in this relationship. Although the group members can sometimes act in a destructive way, like in the uh, Mitchell's anti-group or malignant mirroring, frequently as a reaction to the lack of clear boundaries, they can also act in a way that overcomes the limitations of a leaking container, as we saw in the online group that searched for creative ways to bypass the virtual distance. The participants can do this by imagining the group as a good enough holding environment despite its problematic real qualities. The function of the group depends not on the real properties of the setting, but more on the imagined ones, those that we keep in our mind. The group matrix is not based on the existence of physical boundaries or even human bodies and refers to a relational interface. Perhaps this is the invisible group that Agazarian mentioned in the 12th Fuchs lecture in uh, 1989. It is important to understand that this has absolutely nothing to do with the real visible group in the real visible, uh, with the real visible people in the real visible group. The mere fact that we enter a therapy group implies certain conventional and social definitions of the setting that goes beyond what the real situation provides. Thus, in an online group, we can imagine ourselves part of the virtual group and rely on the illusion that we are still protected by our self-boundaries, meaning that we are able to choose whether to self-disclose or feel protected enough despite the boundless cyberspace. In demonstration groups, the permeable membrane that exists between the demonstration and observation group during moments when projective identification is rife, uh, pushes the group to unconsciously create in the group mind an impermeable membrane around itself for protection. Thus it seems as if something happens in the mind of the conductor and or in the mind of the group members to create the illusion of safety. So far, we, imagined, uh, we examined separately the role of the conductor's presence and the role of the invisible group in the mind of the participant to, group, to keep the group advancing and thriving. However, in the group analytic and relational tradition, we cannot talk about one element without including the other, just as we cannot talk about the individual outside his or her social context. This idea is best, best encompassed by field theory that takes into consideration the dynamic forces acting in a certain psychological field. I will elaborate a little more on the field theory because it provides a good theoretical frame for the success of impossible groups. Tubert Auckland there summarized the dynamic properties of the analytic field according to Baranger and Baranger. I will use some of his point, changing the words analytic field to the group analytic field or to the group matrix and adding other words. The group analytic situation is a multi-personal field in which all parties determine each other and whose experience and behavior in this context cannot be fully understood without due reference to the other. The 
multi-personal field matrix of the group analytic situation is structured along three, along three lines, derived from three basic configura configurations. Analytic contract, manifest um, material, and C, which is the more important for me, the unconscious fantasy that underlies all manifest expressions and latent of or unconscious content. This fantasy does not belong only to the group members, it is rather a co-creation by all parties in the group, a multi-fantasy. Insight is also a field phenomenon which may be defined as a restructuring of, a field, of the field matrix, a gradual development of all parties' understanding of their shared unconscious situation. These ideas help us understand how a safe enough environment is co-created in the mind of the group in collaboration with the fantasy of the secure presence of the conductor. This multi-unconscious fantasy connects group members and conductors and allows for insight and growth even when real circumstances would seem to block any progress. Although it might be beyond the scope of this presentation, this explanation touches a deep philosophical question of what is the mind. Does the mind reside only inside the brain, or is it also something that flows between people? The mind can be defined as a process that regulate, regulates or the flow of energy and information. Siegel says, the mind emerges in the transaction of at least neurobiological and interpersonal processes. Energy and information can flow within one brain or between brains. Here's what Hooks had to say about the mind. Personally, I believe that the multipersonal hypothesis of mind is nearer the true nature of events. I found the old theory of perceiving, of, per of perceiving this in terms of individuals and their interaction as individual minds enclosed in each skull, interacting in the most complicated fashion with the others, that this theory acted as a great barrier to my understanding. Thank you very much. <laughs>